Introduction to Interlocking Systems, or How to Stop Trains from Colliding with Stuff. This lecture is part of the pre-study for LMR 36, Railway Control Systems Engineering. We're going to talk about the risks addressed by interlockings, which is one of the main roles of interlocking systems, where the interlocking fits into the railway control system architecture, and then, at the principles level, how the interlocking mitigates each risk. At the end of the session, you should be able to explain the role of interlocking systems. The purpose of a railway control system is to ensure the safe and efficient movement of trains. Looking at the safety part, a railway control system mitigates the risk of trains colliding with other rolling stock, derailing, colliding with people or vehicles at level crossings, entering a line where it is incompatible with the infrastructure, or colliding with maintainers or their equipment. Looking at the efficiency part, from the perspective of the interlocking, the key issue is to align with it the operational requirements. How does the interlocking fit into the railway control system architecture? A railway control system allows the communication of movement authorities from a signaller to a driver. The signaller could be a human, or it could be some type of automation, such as an automatic route setting system. The driver could be a human, or it could be some type of automation, such as automatic train operation. The railway control system between the signaller and the driver consists of several subsystems. The signaller will have some type of train control system. This could be a mechanical lever frame, or a push button panel, or a VDU based system. Train detection allows the railway control system to know where the trains are. This could be track circuits, axle counters, or the train itself advising the railway control system where it is. There are point operating mechanisms. These could be human operated, such as someone operating this ground frame on the left, or it could be power operated, for instance, using an electrical, hydraulic, or pneumatic point machine. There is the means by which the railway control system communicates the movement authority to the driver. It could be by semaphore signals, or color light signals, or in cab display. There could also be train protection systems to mitigate the risk of a train exceeding its movement authority. There are many systems such as train stops or TPWS. There are the means by which the railway control system communicates with road users at level crossings. This could include bells, flashing lights and booms, and this could include pedestrian gates. But how to ensure that if the signaller tries to send a movement authority to the driver or to move a set of points, that it is safe to do so. This is where the interlocking comes in. The interlocking takes inputs from all of the other subsystems, requests from the signaller, where the trains are from the train detection, what lie the points are in, and so on. It considers whether any requests are safe, and if so, sends outputs such as moving points to the opposite lie, starting level crossing operation, making signals change state, and so on. The interlocking could be mechanical, or electrical, or electronic. So what does the interlocking check for? Let's go back to the risks we talked about at the start. Consider the trains colliding with other trains risk. There are three principal scenarios for this. Firstly, there is a train colliding with the rear of another train. Before the interlocking allows a movement authority to be given to train A, it first confirms that there is no other train within the limits of that movement authority. And once that uh, train B here has moved out of the limits of that movement authority, it can then allow train, the movement authority to train A. Secondly, there is the train colliding with the front of another train. Before the interlocking allows a movement authority to be given to a train, it first confirms that no part of that infrastructure has already been allocated to another train. Here we can see that train A has been authorized to go from signal one to signal two. 
The interlocking remembers this. If the signaler was to request train B to go from signal 3 to signal 4, even though there is currently no train between signal 3 and signal 4, the interlocking would, re would reject the request because parts of that infrastructure has been already allocated to train A. Thirdly, there is the train colliding with a train that, whilst not in the direct line of route, is foul of the route. I've actually been telling you a lie. Sometimes we actually have an operational requirement for trains to collide with other trains. We need to be able to attach locomotives to the head of a train or to couple two trains together. These are actually trains colliding. We need to make sure that these collisions happen safely. We will need to relax some of the safety checks I mentioned before, but add other safety checks. Typically, the signaler will need to make a different request into the train control system. This shows that the signaler specifically wants this type of train movement to occur. Typically, both trains will need to be proved at a stand before the movement authority can be given. The driver will then be given a movement authority that means proceed, being prepared to stop short of any obstruction. Now let's consider the train's derailing risk. The principal risk here is that points are not in the correct position for the train. Before the interlocking allows a movement authority to be given to train A, it first confirms that points two are set, locked and detected in the correct position for the train. The detection means that the switch rails are detected as being in the correct position for the movement. Once the movement authority has been given to train A, it will hold points two in that position until train A is clear of the points. Once train A is clear of points, they can become free for another movement. Additionally, the speed appropriate to that route needs to be communicated to the driver so the driver can regulate the speed of that train accordingly. Train protection systems may be provided that ensure that the train driver does not go through the diverging leg of the points too quickly and derail. And train protection systems may be provided to ensure that the driver does not overspeed and derail on plane track. Now let's consider the trains colliding with people or vehicles at level crossings risk. The interlocking ensures that for level crossings with active protection, so that's bells, lights, booms, gates, etc., that the road users are given an appropriate amount of warning before the train arrives at the crossing. The interlocking also ensures that where there are booms or gates, that a minimum time is achieved for road vehicles to use the crossing before activating the crossing again for a second train. Otherwise, if the booms have, if the booms have only just risen and the crossing commences operation again, the booms could come straight down on top of a car. Now let's consider the trains entering a line where it is incompatible with the infrastructure risk. There are many types of incompatibilities, and only some of these are addressed in the interlocking. For instance, the interlocking could be configured to prevent electric trains from entering non-electrified lines. Or in dual gauge areas, the interlocking would need to be configured to prevent a train of one gauge entering a line that is of the other gauge. Now let's consider the train colliding with maintainers or their equipment risk. The signaler will be provided with the ability to prevent movement authorities from being issued as a reminder that maintainers are in that area. This functionally, functionality may be included in the interlocking. The maintainer may also be provided with a device that prevents movement authorities from being issued. Right back at the beginning of this presentation, we stated that the purpose of a railway control system is to ensure the safe and efficient movement of trains. From the interlocking's perspective, the key item is matching the railway control system with the operation requirements. For instance, if the railway needs to run trains at a three minute headway, then the railway control system needs to be arranged to achieve this. However, all of this railway control system equipment costs a lot of money it has not only capital costs during design, construction, testing and commissioning phases, but there are also significant operating costs to maintain the equipment throughout its operational life. So if a particular railway only needs to one, run one train an hour, don't go and provide a railway control system that can allow trains to run at a three minute headway. This would involve a lot of capital cost 
an operating cost for no benefit. In conclusion, we've seen that the interlocking is at the centre of the railway control system architecture, accepting requests from the signaller, inputs from the other subsystems, and checking that the requests are safe before actioning them. We have seen a sample of how, at the principal's level, the interlocking mitigates the risk of trains colliding with other rolling stock, derailing, colliding with people or vehicles at level crossings, entering a line where it is incompatible with the infrastructure, or colliding with maintainers or their equipment. We've also seen that rail the railway control system, and hence the interlocking, needs to be matched with the operational requirements. Thanks for listening.